degrees in the morning, something like that. And right now it's about 34. Why is that going to be? Because it's going to be clear. So what's the clear skies have to do with that? You'd think it might be warmer because the sun's beating on us. But actually, what's going on? It's the radiation. The, when you have clouds, you have a greenhouse effect. In other words, some of the, those infrared things get through. They bounce. And then they bounce up, hit the clouds, and they come back. And it keeps us nice and keeps it a little warmer. So that's why whenever there's a big snow, usually when there's a big snowstorm, the temperature's not that cold. I mean, it's between 28 and 30, usually. But the day after, especially here in the Midwest, the day after a snowstorm, when it's all bright, clear, and sunny, it's bitter, bitter cold because all that energy is just bouncing off that white snow and disappearing up into the sky and makes it very, very cold on the ground. So anyway, so there you go. There's uh, your last little bit of um, chapter 11. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we will start and finish the first two sections of chapter 13. You have to see simple harmonic motion for it to count as a physics class. Otherwise, you haven't been through mechanics. If we don't do simple harmonic motion, at least see it and work a few problems from it. Then, I did you all dirty. You have an assignment 17, but it's not that bad. In other words, it's all extra credit. So in other words, there are, there are 10 problems there from chapter 13. If We'll probably do six of them tonight. And if you do them, you'll get 10 extra credit points. Okay, So that, that I will apply to a test or to your score or something like that. So um, in other words, and <laughs> it's going to be real easy because, and this is terrible. This is going to go out to millions who watch this video. But anyway, that I'm going to do this, but I'm actually going to put the solutions to these problems on. Come on in. I'm actually going to put the solutions to these problems on Blackboard, too, because three of them are going to be, three problems from this unit are going to be, uh, from this chapter, are going to be on the test. So I want you to know how to do them. So you can go practice them, then you can look at the solutions and all that, okay? I don't want to play I got a secret, but, but I just like simple harmonic motion, SHO. Now we call it, well, let's just go to the lecture, the uh, slides to start. We'll go to the slides to start. I bet you we can get really dark. Ooh. Okay. You know, we could do that little chemistry. Have you ever done that with wintergreen mints? Bitten on, Steve's done it. It's an old school thing. You take Lifesavers wintergreen and you crunch down on them real hard with your, kind of your mouth open. And it shoots out green sparks. It's really kind of, oh, well. You all can try that sometime if you're really bored. All right. But I don't know why it works. It's something to do with, the, with your spit. And the, it's, it's, it's one of those um, organic chemist orgo type things. All right. Let's go to our documents. I, oh, I've got a, where's the controls? Oh, okay. Gosh. Ah. Oh. This is killing me. Yes. Came on. That's a good thing. All right. Now, Q13. All right. There we go. That's the cover of your physics book. Oh, did I ask you? All right. I asked like three of you. I want to ask a quick question. And I wish all of you out in TV land could send this in. Oh, by the way, video people, um, I'll have your test graded probably by Thursday or Friday, and you can look for your grades probably Thursday evening or so for this test. But anyway, all right. Now, um, here we go. Simple harmonic motion. Okay. Um, we're, we're just going to look at simple harmonic motion and equation of motion. Harmonic motion. Harmonic means we're going to use sines and cosines. It repeats itself. It goes back and forth. It iterates. Okay? And so um, it actually uh, follow. it's analogous to a unit, something going around a unit circle. Because it goes around and around. And so it, we use the unit circle, actually, to show simple harmonic motion. All right? Okay, 
here's the here's the big idea behind all this stuff. It starts with Howe's favorite law, Hooke's law, is right here, and Fx equals the the force on the spring is equal to negative kx. The spring wants to pull back and forth. Now, here it is in equilibrium position. How much elastic potential does it have right here? What's its elastic potential energy at this equilibrium position? Zero. Exactly. Yeah. Don't be bashful. It is zero. What happened to my mouse? I hate this. Okay. I don't have a mouse anymore, but it should be here. Oh. All right. Anyway, there it is. All right. Now, right here, this position right here, I've taken it to, it disappeared right when I wanted it to this time. X equals positive A. Okay. So X equals positive A. That's my amplitude that I'd pull it back to this distance. Okay. Just before release. And then that would be at its maximum elastic potential, which is one half KX squared. All right. And then, so if I let it go, whoosh, it comes flying through here, okay? It comes flying through here, and um, this is when it's at its maximum speed. Because it has no potential energy anymore, it's all kinetic. So, one-half kx squared then equals one-half mv squared, all right? So, this is the way you'd find your maximum velocity. We're going to do all these. We'll, we'll do these problems. And then... It compresses the spring to the same distance as A if there's no energy lost. But of course, there's going to be energy lost on this thing. If there's any friction, any jiggling of the spring whatsoever, the very um, heat in the spring from getting compressed, all those kinds of things, there is going to be some energy lost. But, but we'll say it's negligible for right now. So this is when it's gone through half a cycle. Okay, so if we, we started here, Here's going through a fourth of a cycle, and then it comes all the way compressed here. It's gone through half a cycle, then it shoots back to its maximum velocity, then it starts to slow down until it reaches here, then it's gone through the entire um, cycle. And the time it takes to go through an entire cycle is called the period, capital T. Okay? That's the period, capital T. All right. And so that's so here's here's your here's your um, definitions for simple harmonic motion right now. Displacement is x. Okay, maximum displacement is a. It's the maximum displacement. That's the amplitude. Okay, and then anything between zero and a is your x value, or anything between zero and negative x is your or negative a is your x value is is your x value. Okay, now. Here's one of the key parts to this whole thing. It's one of the key parts to this whole thing. Is the acceleration constant when we're dealing with springs? Is the acceleration constant? Now, this thing goes from zero to a maximum velocity, so there's got to be an acceleration, but is the acceleration constant? No, you're right. It is not constant, okay? So the acceleration is not constant because the force in the spring, okay, the force in the spring, the further you stretch the spring, the greater the force, right? And so as you decrease that, as the spring comes back, then the acceleration lessens and lessens and lessens until it's zero. It's got to go, because I got to have a, a, a zero acceleration because I'm at my maximum speed right here. I can't speed up or slow down, so there's no, and then it starts applying a negative acceleration this way to slow it down to here. All right, so that's why we just kind of gloss over some of the mathematics of this. If you really want to derive the formulas we're going to get to, you can take physics 310. Dr. Zhu would be very happy to have you in there, if you, if, but you have to have up through differential equations to take it. But other than that, it's not bad. All right. Okay, so here's all the stuff. Oh, by the way, when we talk about frequency, that's in Hertz. It's named after a German physicist who dealt a lot with uh, waves and electromagnetic waves back in the 1800s when they were putting all this, when they were dealing with electromagnetic waves, which we'll deal with next semester. Okay.
Boom. All right. Potential energy of a spring. There it is. U equals one half kx squared. The maximum potential energy is when it's at its amplitude. Stretch that spring to its amplitude. It's got maximum kinetic energy. Now, I might do you dirty on the test. Because what we might do, because you know how much I love E initial equals E final problems, right? Okay, we might have this E equals now. If I stretch it to my amplitude and I just let it go, then the velocity at a certain distance will be something, right? Okay, but, uh, well, it, it, um, it, it will, let me back up. Let me make some sense here. If I stretch the spring out to a certain distance A, but then I add, an ex I, I add a velocity to it instead of just letting it go, is it going to, when it gets down to this end, is it going to compress further than that A distance that I stretched it? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it will. It's, it's like if I, if I pull a str spring down, instead of just letting it go, I kind of throw it up to a little bit so it's got an extra velocity after it, it leaves my hand. Then it'll go, it'll bang up a little bit higher, right? Okay, so we might look at, in fact, we're going to look at one of those types of problems. All right? So the total energy of an object in simple harmonic motion, here you go. Here's its maximum energy right here. And then it comes over here. This is where it's at its maximum kinetic energy. And then right here, it's at its maximum potential energy again. And you can just set up a parabolic well, I think, is what they, is what they do later on. Show this. Okay, now, a few quick and dirty calculations. And V is equal to, in other words, here's how they got this. If I set... 1 half mv squared max equal to 1 half kx squared, okay? But I'm going to take a point in the, in the middle between the two. I derived this formula for the, for the afternoon during the matinee, but um, I'm not going to do it today. Basically, all we did was say 1 half mv squared plus one half kx squared, which is be the energy somewhere in the middle, right? Equals one half ka squared. All right. All right. Let me do it real quick. Here's how we got that v. All right. I'm going to turn on the light so you might be able to see this. I'm going to leave this on. This could be annoying, but that's okay. All right. I'm going to try and do this back over here. I don't know if Steve and Don or Robin can see this, but. We'll see. All right, here's what we're doing. In other words, one half mv squared plus one half kx squared. That's its velocity anywhere in the middle here from where I've stretched it out from x naught and I've stretched the spring out a little bit. Okay, this amplitude a. So somewhere right here at x, as it's shooting back, as it's hurtling back here. Somewhere right here, it's got a velocity. It's not at a maximum velocity yet, but the total energy in the system is equal to one half k a squared. All right. And so to find this v, here's all we got to do. First of all, it's nice. We don't have any mgh to worry about, so we can just eliminate the halves. We get mv squared plus kx squared equals k a squared. Then mv squared equals k a squared minus k x squared. And then v squared equals k over m times uh, a squared minus x squared. Take square root of both sides. v equals square root of k over m times a squared minus x squared. Okay? All right. And the maximum, the maximum speed occurs when x is 0. Okay? The maximum uh, occurs when x gets here to this equilibrium position at 0. And so v max equals the square root of k, k over m times a. All right? So v max equals the square root of k over m times a. Let me at least help a little bit here. There we go. Get some of that garbage out of there. 
It's not helping Bo much, but. All right. But it's in the book. All right, now, I got a quick question for you, though. When was the last time? Now, remember, I said that, that we pattern these equations off the units, something going in uniform circular motion. When was the last time you saw V equals some number, some number here, times a meters? This is in meters. So you got two things. V equals two things multiplied by each other. What would that be? Thinking of uniform circular motion, what would it be? V equals what? RW? Yeah, that's what, oh, no, right. I'm not after V equals, right, no. V equals R times omega. Remember that? For a unit circle, for the velocity, we had V equals R. Well, I'm going to put it as omega R this time. And so we got the same thing here. V equals the square root of K over M times A, where this is omega and this is R. This is my maximum R. And omega doesn't change. And so um, springs have an angular speed that stays constant. Okay? They have an angular speed that stays constant. All right, and it's equal to the square root of k over m. What's k again? I kind of, do y'all remember that? It's the spring constant. How do we measure it? What's its units? It's the spring constant, okay. F equals kx. Well, it looks like force is measured in what? Newtons. So if this is a meters, this better be Newtons per meter times meter, so it, it knocks it out, okay? So remember, K is in Newtons per meter, all right? That's why it takes a lot more strength to pull, if, if, you, have a, if you have a uh, spring with a um, K of 100 Newtons per meter, stretch it back one meter, it only took 100 Newtons of force. How many Newtons of force does it take if you stretch it back two meters? 200 newtons of force. See, that's why the acceleration is also not constant. Okay? All right. Okay. So V max equals Km over A. That's our V max there, which also equals omega times R. All right? Okay, and here they show the energy well of something. This actually isn't a bad slide. It looks complicated at first, but what they're trying to do is show you that the parabola here is made up of the one half kx squared, right? The parabola is made of, this is our one half kx squared parabola. And as it comes down here, we're at the max. And then like at this point, oh, I've got mostly kinetic energy. And right here is uh, the kx squared at point x1. That kind of stuff. And then right here, it's all kinetic energy at this point. But the total energy in the system remains constant. It never changes. Whoops. It never changes. All right. Here's where they kind of set it up, showing simple harmonic motion. Okay, now the equations of simple harmonic motion. All right. Here we go. I think this is when I... Okay, it's Y equals a sine omega t. Remember, we got the radians per second. T. Now, we're going to go through these things so that you can see. Now, look, if I have radians per second times second, that just gives me radians. So we start the whole thing with y equals a sine theta or y equals a cosine theta. And I'll show you the two difference. It depends on what we call, those of you who've had a little calculus, especially those of you who've had some differential equations, know what we mean by initial conditions. In other words, where are we starting the problem? We're starting at a equals zero, or the x equals zero, and the time equals zero, or are we starting where we stretch the spring out where y equals a of the spring, okay? And then it makes a complete, it makes uh, a lot of difference because of this. Notice, 
as we go through here, if we start here where y, the initial conditions are y equals a, then this is a cosine curve. Okay? This is a cosine curve. However, starting right here, at this point, I have a sine curve. All right, so it depends. So if we wanted to start with a equals 0, oh, then I'd start here. So I got a sine curve. But if I start with a equals, or if I start with the initial condition is up here at a, then I've got the cosine curve. It's a little confusing, but um, you'll see how it works here in a minute. Okay, now, the period, this makes, all right, the period for motion of anything, of this stuff, is this. The period is 2 pi times the square root of m over k. Because omega was equal to k over m, remember we had the frequency. Remember when we had frequency equals, uh, well, omega equals 2 pi times the frequency. So if omega equals 2 pi times the frequency, then the frequency is just 1 over 2 pi times that k over m. We'll, we'll work with these here in a minute so that they can be hammered out. And I want you to add one more formula. Let's add one more formula. The period for a pendulum, okay? And the period for a pendulum is this. T, for a simple pendulum, the period for a simple pendulum is 2 pi times L over G. Now that's for a simple pendulum, okay? And I'm going to tell you right now, you, those of you out in TV land can understand this. I'm probably going to give you a problem on your test, on your last test, that says how long does a simple pendulum have to be for it to have a period of one second? Thank you all can do that. If you've got two pi, you can see what's going on. Yeah, finally, you give, us a, you give us a problem where you've got one unknown and just one little equation. Right. Okay. And, and I can square both sides all day long. Right? Crank that sucker out. There we go. All right. I got a question for you. How long would it have to be shorter or longer if I took that pendulum up to the moon? Where G is 1 6 G. The new gravity. If I took it up on the moon, now I've got, instead of G, I've got 1 6 G. What would my length be to get it to be T? Would it have to be as long or could I make it a little bit shorter? I'll probably need to make it quite a bit shorter, like 1 sixth. 1 sixth shorter. Because on the moon, my pendulum is just going to go float, float, right? I mean, so if I make it shorter, it'll go tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, really fast. Okay. All right. Wish we had more time to talk about the pendulum. Because notice, oh, notice in our simple pendulum problem here, do you see any mass? Do you see any mass here? Now, if I get into what is known as a physical pendulum, there is mass in there because we look at you, you all's favorite, the moment of inertia stuff, I, is, is involved in the equation. But for the most part, for a simple pendulum, there's no mass. And that's what Galileo kind of recognized, you know, when he was going to mass and stuff like that. He was sitting in the, in the cathedral looking at the chandelier, or the uh, candles that they have. Well, the chandeliers on the candles that they have. And you'd notice that when the wind was blowing, they would all kind of, everything seemed to have the same period if it was the same length and stuff like that. So, and that's, he started playing with the, the pendulum. Okay. All right. Now, you know what we're going to do? Oh, here it is. The equations of motion that shows, okay, based on the initial conditions, this is if we're going to start where y equals zero to start, and then we got a nice sine curve. And here it's out of phase by 90 degrees. If we start with y equals some a, then it looks like this. So then it's a cosine theta. All right. And then we're going to derive two more equations out of this. Here we go. Right here. 
Here's a new way to look at VMAX. All right, and I'll put up all these here in a minute. And, we'll, and then we'll work some problems, and then I'll tell you what else is going to be on the test. Okay. All right. So, if I start, if I have y t equals a cosine omega t, I'm start. I'm going to use this. I'm picking this equation to use based on the initial conditions. How many of you have had calculus? Oh, we're taking it. I know Rachel's taking it right now. Okay, just a handful of you. All right, I had more in my... Do y'all remember how to take the derivative of a cosine? Of course. What's it going to be? Negative sine. Negative sine. What else? V will be my first derivative. It's going to be what? Negative sine omega t. There's going to be that A there. What else is, goes in there? Chain rule. Remember the chain rule? I also got to take the derivative of this with relation to t, and that will be omega. Oom, chunk, oom, chunk. Anyway, that's the sound of the men working on the chain rule. Anyway, all right. Sorry, bad math joke. Okay, and then by acceleration, I'm going to take the, uh, the acceleration of, I'm going to take the derivative of this, and get a omega squared uh, cosine omega t. It just, come, it just swings back. But v max then, v max again, and we're just going to look at the magnitude of it, not really the direction. The magnitude of it then, v max, the magnitude of v max is going to be when the sine is at 90 degrees, when omega, t, when omega times t equals some multiple of 90 or, 290, or 270 degrees or pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2 okay and so that will just be a omega which we've already done because omega is equal to square root of k over m right and a max the maximum acceleration is going to equal a omega squared which is equal to now this is kind of this kind of got me excited this is kind of cool because this equals if you think I'm going to I'm going to turn all this off and do this one because this one kind of puts together some things. We're done with the laser light show. It's time to turn this thing off. All right, there we go. Raise the screen and get started with this cool derivation to show you the maximum acceleration. Were you all able to pick up any of that scribbling? over there on the video? Is it coming out? Is it working? Okay. All right. We're, we'll see. All right. Well, I guess we'll see when we go to the thing. All right. But anyway, let's take a look at this. What, what do we have here? I've got A max. Now look. A max equals um, a force over a thing, right? Over a <laughs> force over a thing. Over acceleration equals a force divided by its mass, right? Of the object. Alright? So, but also, now look, uh, the force is equal to k times x. Hooke's law divided by the mass. Aha. Omega squared is equal to Square root of k over m squared, which equals k over m. Guess what I got right here? So that's another way to find your max. If you know Hooke's law and you know how far it's, it, um, you can also say, oh, well, my a max then, another way to write it is just, well, that's just Hooke's law, kx over the mass. That's your maximum acceleration. Remember, because it stops pulling on it, it doesn't keep that up the whole time. It dissipates down because once x equals 0, what's my acceleration? I don't have one anymore. Right? All right. So let's do some of your problems. All right? Now, here are the problems that I've assigned you. And I will have to read them um, 
I could put them up on the screen, but eh, I'm just going to uh, hold on a second while we uh, while I go to your problems that I gave you. And we'll start with the hardest one. What I did this afternoon is I started with the hardest one and worked backwards. We'll spend about 20 minutes doing some of these, and then we will. Uh. The test in here is Tuesday. Sorry, don't mean to ear hustle. Years of years of high school teaching. Whispers, 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 whispers. and most of the time you didn't even want to know what they were talking about. Oh dear. Ah. <sighs> okay. Okay, now we'll wait for the yes, I want that to work. <gasps> There we go. Assignments. And here it is. Assignment 17. Did you dirty? Okay, let me write down these problems. 6, 7, 16. Here are the problems that I gave you. Of course, I didn't bring a pen with me, but I've got one right here. Here are the problems from chapter 13 that I gave you all. And they are 6 and 7, which are fairly easy. 6 and 7, 16, 12, 16, 21, 22, 26, 33, and 38. What's that? Yeah, it's not too rough. It's not bad. We're going to do the opposite of a Tina Turner lesson here. We're going to start rough, and then we're going to end nice and easy. Okay, so let's take a look. At prop, so you can get used to seeing what these things look like. All right. First of all, let's get all of our little nuanced equations here. Omega equals the square root of k over m. All right. Um, y or simple harmonic or even x. You can also put in the x is equal to a cosine omega t. Um, the f uh, period is equal to 2 pi times square root of m over k. All right, the frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k over m. Because remember, 1 over the frequency is equal to the period. All right, those all hold us in good stead. I think that's about all we need. Oh, um, v max is equal to k over m times a. Uh, a max is equal to k over m times a, and uh, the velocity anywhere along the thing is equal to the square root of k over m, because you just keep in the back of your mind that omega times r thing, times a squared minus x squared square rooted. I should have put both those over the square root sign, but I didn't. And remember, 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 we always want to do this. The square root of this does not equal a minus x. Those a minus x. Those two things, this is not equal. Because remember, if I factor this guy, he's a minus x times a plus x, actually. Right? So that that's not a that's not a valid move. Don't do that. Okay. All right. There you go. 
armed with these bad boys, which you're going to bring on your cheat sheet for the last test, we can do anything with this stuff if we understand what it's saying. So let's start. Let's go to chapter uh, 23. 23. Why did I say that? I have no idea. Let's go to chapter 13. Here's problem 38. It says this. What is the maximum elastic potential energy of a simple horizontal mass spring oscillator whose equation of motion is given by x equals 0.35 sine times 7 radians times t. Here's what they want. Oh, yeah, we forgot some of these. E uh, equals 1 half k a squared. That's the, that's the max. That's the total energy. And um, always keep in mind, E naught equals E final. So where you can have your kinetic energy, your potential, and your, your gravitational potential, and your elastic potential equal to your final velocity and all that stuff. And we'll, we'll look at that problem here in a minute. So this problem s looks hard. It looks ugly. But they say this. X equals 0.35 sine of 7.0 radians per second, that's our omega, times t. Okay? And here's what they want us to say. Here's what they want us to find. They ask us, they say, what is the maximum potential energy of this guy? Oh, and they, and they come in and they say, by the way, the spring, the, the mass of the thing is equal to 0.9 kilograms. Okay. So, we want the maximum potential energy, which is this guy, right? And this is all I've got, is this equation. What do I have here? What do I know from this guy right here, from this problem 38 here? What do I know? What's, do, have, they, have they told me what A is? What's A? It's as easy as you think. Yeah, it's 0.35. 0.35. But do they give me K? I need K. Did they give it to me? Is K buried in there anywhere? Kind of. What did they actually give me? They gave me omega. Omega equals 7.0 radians per second. That's what they gave me. Can I figure out? Oh, Ah, they think they're being slick, okay? Because they gave me omega, but here, it, here he is. He's the square root of k over m. I think I can get m, or k, because they gave me m, right? They gave me what the mass was. So, I can do this. I can say uh, 7.0 radians per second equals the square root of k over 0.9. Square both sides, I get 49 equals k over m, 49 times 0.9 equals k. Aha! Now I got him. I got him on the run. This is about 44 newtons per meter, roughly. 49 times 0.9 is probably right around 44 newtons per meter. Okay? And... So the energy of that thing would be one half of 44 times 0.35 squared. Whatever that comes out to be. 22 times 0.35 times 0.35, whatever. Okay? So that, that was kind of the trickiest one. All of them are kind of that easy. You just got to kind of manipulate. You kind of got to look over here and go, now what are they asking for? Oh, okay, they're asking for K. Or, or I've got to get K to be able to find a thing. Let's take a look at uh, problem 33 that they gave us on that. Here's what problem 33 says. This one, we're using the equation again. They're saying, hey, oh, let's don't forget this equation right here where we've got the velocity is equal to A omega times the sine, sine of omega times T. 
too. We got that one. All right. Now, then, this one says 33. It says uh, the velocity of a vertically os oscillating mass spring system is given by V equals 0.65 meters per second. So this is what problem 33 looks like. V equals 0.65 meters per second times the sine of, is it 4? Yeah, 4.0 radians per second times time. Okay? So they give me the velocity is. And what they want to find, what, what they want to know is, I think they're going to be slick here, and they're going to say, hey, determine the amplitude and determine the maximum acceleration. So they want A max So they want A max, and they also want A. OK. Now, did they give me A? They want you to say, yes, they did. But did they? Did they give me the amplitude? Look, look at this guy and model this one. Did they give me what A was? No, they did not. They gave me what A times de omega was. But they gave me omega, okay? They at least gave me omega. They said omega is equal to 4.0 radians per second. Aha! So now I can figure out A because A is just equal to, uh, um, because the 0.65 meters per second is equal to A. This is my R omega, basically. 4.0 radians per second. So A equals 0.65 over 4. Okay. Well, there we go. And then A max. Do we have a formula for A max? Yeah, here it is. Is that the one I want? Does that help me at all? Oh, yeah, because A max also equals A times omega squared. And they gave me omega. These two guys are, are equivalent. Okay, so they gave me, so I got that, and then I'll just take times 4 squared. So A max is equal to uh, 0.65 over 4 times 4 squared, which gives me 0.65 times 4. Hey, I can do that one, I think. 0.65 times 2 is 1.3 times 2 again is 2.6 meters per second squared. There we go. All right. So those are the two harder ones to do. What does 26 look like? Is that one where I do you dirty at all? I don't think so. Nah, 26 is straightforward. It's just like these guys. 26 is actually kind of a nice, might be a nice test type question, um, where they give you the equation, but this time they give you the equation of a, they say, uh, on 26, they basically say this, y equals a sine omega t. Now, they give you numbers. They put numbers in here for A and omega T. So they're starting out with the initial conditions are equal to A equals 0, or at, or at X equals 0, and uh, omega uh, and uh, T equals 0, probably. Um, and anyway, uh, they, want, they want to know what is the frequency, what's the amplitude, which you can just fill in because they give it to you. And what is the period? Well, you 
you've got that because you can get omega and they give you the mass they gi they also give you the mass of the thing i think no they don't Hold on a second. The equation of motion. Oh, 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 oh. We don't need mass. We don't need no stinking mass. I forgot. Omega equals 2 pi f. Hey, there we go. Run away. They give you omega. So you can find the frequency and remember that. 1 over the frequency is equal to the period. I got, sorry about that. Kind of went to Venus there for a minute. All right. Let's take a look at one more of these because the rest of them are, will just fall into place. Let's take a look at 16 because it's a good test type question too. 16 is a great test type question. All right. Hold on one second. I'm finding other good ones too. Here as I'm going through. Okay, I, I'm I'm done now. All right, 16. 16 says this because this is a good test. Like it says we got a vertical spring. Okay, we've got a spring hanging like this. Got a spring, and it's in its equilibrium position. Okay. Here comes a ball. Smashes into it. Okay, so this ball is moving up here. V. This ball is moving up, and then it hits it right here. We'll, we'll let this be ground zero. This, we'll let this be y equals zero right here. And then what happens, so this is situation one, and then here's that. And then what happens is it smashes it up to a position right here. So it's smashed at this position H, which also equals the amplitude. Okay. And the question is this. What's V naught? All right. Now here's the information that they give us. Basically what they're saying is, hey, this ball comes, it's flying up in the air, and it smacks into the spring compresses it a certain distance, okay, and then it comes to rest, right? So right here, what's the final, what's, an easier question would be, what's the final velocity of that ball? Zero, all right, okay, so we're off, we're off and rolling, all right? Now, here's what they gave us. They told, th this, these are energy type questions. These are good E naught equals E final stuff. Okay, this is good. E naught equals E final. Okay, all right. So, and the information they give me is the mass of the block is 0.35 kilograms. It compresses the, the spring 4.5 centimeters, so that means H equals 0 0.045 meters, and that's the same as my amplitude. All right. Uh, before coming to rest, if the spring constant is, and they give me K, which is 50 newtons per meter, what was the initial speed of the block that smashed into it? Okay, so what I'm after is one half mv squared, mv naught squared, because at this juncture right here, y is equal to zero, so mgh is equal to zero, and the spring is not sprung at all, so one half, so x is at zero, so how far it's going to smush is zero too, right? So that's at zero, but this is going to equal one half kx squared, or let's make it a squared, plus mga. 
Don't forget about your gravity. If it's vertical, don't forget about your gravitational potential. Well, I'll be darned. Yeah. It looks like I've got a number because they gave me mass, they gave me K, and they gave me A. They said the mass was equal to 0.35 kilograms, and they said that uh, K was equal to 50 newtons per meter, and they said that A was equal to 0 0.045 meters. Hey, I got all the numbers I need for over here. I got all the numbers I need for, I got everything I need except for V naught. That's not bad. But you got to understand those E naught equals E final. All right, I'm going to do one more because it's a good test type question too. All right. Um, it says this. I'm looking for the one where I throw the spring at a certain... Oh, here it is. This is problem 13, which I couldn't give you for some reason. It says a horizontal spring on a frictionless track. So let's look at a horizontal spring on a frictionless track. Okay, stretch this thing out. Put a block there. All right, stretch this thing out a certain distance. This is x naught equals 0. I stretch it out a distance a. Okay, so right now its energy, its initial energy so far is equal to 1 half k a squared. However, I'm going to do one more thing to it. I'm going to release this thing so it has a v naught equals 2.2 .2 meters per second. Okay, ah, so that means I've got to add plus a one half m v naught squared here. And then their question is this How far, when it comes zooming past here, and then it compresses the spring here, how far is that x final going to be? Actually, the, the question is what's the difference between x final and a? Well, let's just find x final. First of all, if a, if we stretch to the distance, if a is stretched a distance um, 0 0.065 meters, and the mass of this thing is 0.35 kilograms, Mass of my block is 0.35 kilograms. If I stretch that thing 0 0.065 meters and I give it an extra little velocity, I'm getting an extra energy. Is XF going to be greater than A? I hope so. I hope so. Because this whole thing, so then this equals my E final, which is 1 half KX final squared which equals my E final. So E initial equals E final because we're not losing any uh, to heat or because when those springs compress and go like this for a long time they start to get hot they lose energy that way there's friction there's all kinds of things but we're not worried about those right now little springs are a conserving force they put things back where it started it's basically what a conserving force means okay let's talk about the exam that will get you through that that's we did quite a few of your things. We did the hardest ones. You'll be able to, armed with these guys over here, these little nuanced things right here, you'll be able to do the rest of those extra credit problems. All right, now, let's go back and see what the test is going to be about. All right, first, first things first. I need to, we got, we got plenty of time to talk about it. Good. I know some of you are anxious to get on the road so you can get out of this nasty weather. Uh, basically, I'm going to take the end of chapter 9, which didn't do a very good job. Well, well, actually it did. I did a bad job of explaining the Bernoulli principle. Remember when you had the, the, the Manley professor problem? He blew the air over the penny and it rose up and flipped in the cup. Remember that problem? You might get a problem kind of like that. All right. You'll probably get a problem more. Um, 
Oh, one of the things science books like physics books like to talk about is the Bernoulli effect of um, <clears throat> the Bernoulli effect of a uh, what do I do with my here it is um, Bernoulli effect of on an airplane wing. All right. Basically, what happens is since these air molecules split up or they go over the top of the wing from the ones going around the bottom and then they marry up again at the other side. These going over the top go much faster, so they got less pressure, so that gives you some lift. Now, that works for Piper Cubs and stuff like that. It doesn't work for F-18s, okay? Basically, F-18s, they need thrust, and they need angle of attack of the wing, all right? It's the main thing to um, give you lift. But basically, what we're saying here is, due to the conservation of energy, we're saying this. Pressure one, here's Bernoulli. Here's, here's what you need to bring in on your cheat sheet. Pressure one plus one half rho v1 squared, that's the velocity of the air, uh, plus uh, rho gh, that's if it's down below or up high or something like that. I'll tell you right now, you probably won't have to worry about rho gh1. Equals p2 plus one half rho v2 squared plus rho G H two, all right. Conservation of energy. Okay, so basically, what I'm going to ask you, the the way you work this Bernoulli equation is the problems usually have to do with a change in pressure. That was the same thing that you had with the guy blowing over the penny. Is the change of pressure? You had the air pressure underneath the penny was one thing, and the pressure over the top was different. And if it was greater than mg. Whoosh, mg divided by the area of the penny, if that pressure was greater the, the the regular one atmosphere of the room, boom, it flipped into the cup. Okay, maybe, possibly. All right, so this change in P is actually equal to P1 minus P2, which would equal one half rho V2 squared minus V1 squared plus one half rho G H1, H2 minus H1, okay? And you probably won't have to worry about the, the two heights will probably be the same, okay? So you look for the words change in pressure. What's the pressure difference, all right? Or if you get the pressure difference and you get an area, can you figure out what the force is of that air? What does pressure equal? Pressure equals when related to force. Is equal to what? Force over the air. Right, there you go. Force over the area. So therefore, to find the force, it's equal to delta P times A. That's what to expect on the ex being able to read a problem like that and do those two things. That'll be like your first question. Okay? And then, then we're done with chapter 9. Then I feel like we've done everything. In then chapter 10 is about the ideal gas laws, the kinetic theory of gases. It's always fun. It's always fun to, to be able to figure out um, and do thermal expansion too. It's, it's, it's always kind of fun to be able to figure out the speed, the root mean square speed of um, something, or, or is that in chapter 11? Oh, we did that in chapter 11. I'm sorry. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Time out. Time out. Time out. Time. Tweet. Go to your neutral corners. Right. I'm getting ahead of myself. Hold on. Oh, I'm looking at section 10.5. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Now then, here's what we're going to do for chapter 10. Know how to figure out, basically look at problem number 8. Okay? Basically look at a problem like number 8, which, which is basically saying, hey, if... You, if your temperature changes three degrees Celsius, 
what would be your temperature change in Fahrenheit? Okay? Now remember, you don't do, you just look at the rate of change. The change in temperature, in other words, um, if, you're, if your change in Celsius is equal to something, that equals five ninths the change in Fahrenheit. And then vice versa. Change in Fahrenheit equals nine fifths the change in Celsius. Okay. It's, the, it's not asking you to find if I have this temperature in Celsius, I have this temperature, they're looking at the change. All right. Okay. Um, ideal gas laws. This is all stuff from chapter 10. Um, ideal gas laws. Hey, if you got to do this at least once. I know you've done it a million times in chemistry class already, but we're going to do it again. So if you're given an initial temperature and a new pressure and a new volume and a new temperature and an old volume, can you find the original pressure? That should be pretty easy. Okay. And if you haven't done it yet, know how to do the, the wedding ring problem where the guy drops his wedding ring in the hot water and it expands. The diameter changed. Okay. Diameter change. So we're going to do a little thermal expansion thing. And last but not least, it's always fun, kinetic theory of gases to figure out if you have, you know, N2 or if you have O2. I'm going to give you a monoatomic gas. At a certain temperature, how fast are they going? That's always kind of fun. Just good old root mean squared, one half mv squared equals three halves kBT. But T has to be in what? I might do you dirty and give you Celsius. What are you going to have to do? Yeah, change it to Kelvins. A dead giveaway is if the Celsius is at zero, you know you're going to have to change it to Kelvin because you're going to get zero is your thing. All right. So that'll be over chapter 10. Now, I, I may not ask all those, but those are the types of things to look at. And since I just learned how to say calorimetry, we might have something on that. All right, from chapter 11. Basically, from chapter 11 now, know how to do if something gains, it equals what something loses. Right? Gains equal losses. Remember the energy Cm delta T of one material equals Cm delta T of the material that's losing the energy. So the, hot, the hotter thing is losing and the cooler thing is gaining and they meet somewhere in the middle, be able to find that equilibrium temperature. Okay? I won't give you like three things to do. It'll be something pretty simple. It'll say like hot coffee in a styrofoam cup. Okay? And we put some ice cubes in there. Ah, now we got latent heat effusion too. Right? I'll give you what those things are. You don't have to memorize those. You should probably know what C for water is in the physics side. It's 4186, right? Joules per kilogram meters, uh, cent uh, degree centigrade. All right. And then what else from chapter 11? That's about it from chapter 11. Because um, <laughs> we took our little quiz this morning, or not this morning, but uh, when you first came in, it wasn't really a quiz, but it was, you know, I asked you, why is it going to be cold tomorrow when the clouds go away? That's con because of the radiation. And also there's convection taking place. All three um, heat transfer things take place at, all the time. From like if I'm sitting here like this, there's a heat transfer between my hand and the whiteboard. Eventually, they're going to reach the same temperature. But there's also convection going on. Not much radiation because we're these bulbs aren't near like the sun, so there's not a whole lot of heat radiation. But okay, I might ask one question for that, but it'd be so simple. It'd be like. Which one is using convection? Which one's doing? Um, uh, what are the three types of heat transfer? Conduction. Yeah, I can think of conduction. If you have the fire, in other words, if you get a picture of a bonfire, somebody at a bonfire, their hands are over it. Is that convection or or uh, or uh, conduction or radiation that they're feeling the heat? Their hands are over the fire. Convection. 
because the air currents, the, it, that's the, convection is the moving of air or fluids around of different. Uh, convection occurs when you take a, uh, a uh, um, hot water and put it into a boiling hot water and put it into a cool bath to warm it up, okay? Because that's evening it out type thing. That's moving, and then you stir it up. That's convection type stuff, all right? Um, if you're back here and you're feeling the heat that's coming sideways at you, that's radiation. And if you actually have something in the fire that's getting hot, that's conduction. All right, other than that, it's been a good semester. I think, how many of you are taking physics too? Going in, oh my goodness, all right. Um, yeah, I noticed there's quite, how many of you are taking it online or doing the video away? Okay, I'm still mulling this whole quiz thing. I don't know if I'm gonna try it one semester just to try to get people to come to class, but if you got other things to do, you can watch it. So why come to class? I don't know, so it's one of those things. I'm oh, we should probably not be filming this part, but anyway, um, as I'm thinking out loud. But all right. That's all I've got. Be careful going home. And if there is bad, bad weather on Tuesday, here's the deal. If there's bad weather on Tuesday night, okay, and you don't want to come in, if the university's canceled, then we don't have our final, okay? Probably not. I don't want to have to reschedule it, okay? So if it's bad weather, it, but if it's bad weather and the university is not canceled, I don't have the authority to cancel. I'm going to go ahead and have the final because the university was open, but you all can come in like on Thursday with my pros from Dover in the afternoon class and take it if you want to, or arrange with me a different time to take it, okay? So we'll, but I don't think there's gonna be, I think this is our worst weather. We usually don't have to worry about this so early, but <laughs> past couple of years, our storms have been coming early. All right, that's it.